In this second session on logistic regression, we're going to look at it as a descriptive tool. In the previous session, we looked at logistic regression for predicting new records. But like linear regression, this can actually also be used for explaining or for describing a relationship between a y and a set of x's. So now we're going to focus on the interpretation and show you why logistic regression is so useful for explaining a categorical outcome. We're going to have to talk about interpretation. We're going to have to talk about goodness of fit. In other words, how well this model is fitting our data. And finally, we'll also talk about statistical significance and assessing the effect of each predictor on the outcome. So just to revisit the formula, we're talking about a relationship between the predictors and a transformation of our outcome that's called the logit. And the logit is a nonlinear function of the y. In particular, it looks at this concept called the odds, which is a function of the probability of the class of interest. And then we take a log odds, which gives us the logit. Now, what does this mean that we're modeling a relationship between the odds of an event, say of preferring light beer, and the customer's profile? And since we have that exponential term right up front here, this means that we're modeling a multiplicative relationship between the customer's profile and the odds of their preferring light beer. Let's look first at interpretation. How do we interpret the coefficients that we get in the logistic regression? In order to do that, let's look at what the odds actually are. And I'm going to write the odds now as a function of the predictors. And in particular, it's an exponential function. Now, what happens when we increase one of these x's, holding all the others constant, what is going to happen to the odds? So let's look at just adding one unit to x2 and holding all the other x's constant. That's what I'm doing in the numerator. In the denominator, I'm just using the same values, except that I'm not increasing x2 by a unit. If you plug in this formula and just replace x plus 2 with x plus 2 plus 1 in the numerator, you'll find out the, that all the terms actually cancel out, and you're left with the exponent of beta 2. So now look at the beginning and at the end. What this is telling me is that beta 2 is a multiplicative factor by which the odds of the event of interest increase when we increase the value of x2 by a single unit. And, of course, we might want to remember that we held all the other variables constant. So once again, increasing a unit, increasing a predictor by a single unit is going to affect the outcome by a factor of exponent to the beta 2. Let's take a look at an example. Here's a model that we fit to our beer data, and we have a coefficient for income that's equal to 0 0.0002. We can also look at the exponent right away, and in fact, that's why Excel Miner gives us another column that's called the odds. It saves us from going and computing the exponent on our own. And we see that the odds are 1.0002. We can interpret this number by thinking of, again, the multiplicative relationship. It means that as we increase income by a unit, the odds for preferring light beer are going to be increasing by a factor of 1.0002. We're holding everything else constant, meaning that we're increasing income, but we're still looking at the same gender and the same marital status and the same age. Now, is that a big number or a small number? Is an increase by a factor of 1.0002 large or small? Well, it's almost one, which means that nothing is happening. But look, we've increased income by $1 when we're talking about annual income in the tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So let's try and increase income not by $1 by one unit, but by 10,000 units. What do you think is going to happen now? How are the odds going to react if we increase income by $10,000? Stop the video and try and figure it out. Okay, so let's see how this works. What's going to happen here is that we're going to have to multiply the 10,000 by the original coefficient, which was 0 0.0002, and only then take an exponent. A shortcut in this case is just to take the odds 
and take it to the power of 10,000. And in both cases, now we get a factor of 8.2, which sounds a little more significant. What this means is that for every additional $10,000 in your income, your odds of preferring light beer are increasing by a factor of eight, holding everything else constant. Try and solve one of these problems on your own. So we looked at income, let's now look at something else. For every additional five years of age, what are the odds, how are they going to increase that the customer prefers light beer? Are they gonna be higher or lower than for similar customers who are five years younger? Try and solve this problem. Now let's look at interpreting categorical predictors. We looked at numerical predictors where we simply talk about a unit increase and its effect on the odds. What does it mean when we're talking about a dummy variable? So we had gender in this example, and the gender coefficient was negative 1687. Or we can look at the odds of that coefficient that also appear in the table, and that was equal to 0.8447. Now, what is a dummy? A dummy is simply a set of values, either 0 or 1. So a one unit increase means that we're comparing the ones to the zeros. If we're comparing gender, where male equals one, then it means that the, the odds of male preferring light beer are 0.8447 times higher than those of a female. But what does it mean to have odds that are 0.8447 higher? Of course, a number below one means that males are actually less likely to prefer light beer than females. So if we want to convert this into a meaningful sentence, we might want to say, well, males are less likely to prefer light beer than females by a factor of the reciprocal of 0.8447. Now try and do this if with a marital status dummy. Look at the output, try and figure out what should be the right number right here. How much more likely is a single customer to prefer light beer compared to a married customer who has the same profile otherwise. Let's think what this nonlinear relationship means when we make these types of interpretations. Although we did make these claims in terms of odds, so a unit increase in X affects the odds in a certain way, we actually can't make similar statements about the probability. And that is because the probability is related to the predictors in a more complicated way. If you remember, it was quite a complicated function. Let me show you why this is not true. So for example, let's look at a person who's 45 years old, single male, earning $40,000 a year. This customer, we computed earlier on that their preference of light beer is estimated to be 0.3256. Now let's take an identical customer, the only difference being that we're increasing their year by one year. And if we recompute the probability, we get 0.274. So can we actually say that a one year increase increases our probability of preferring light beer by the difference between these two numbers or maybe by their ratio? Well, the answer is no, it's a much more complicated relationship. Let's look at two people who have the same profiles. They're again, male, single males earning the same $40,000 a year. And the only difference is we're gonna look at two people who are 55 years old and 56 years old. And let's see what that extra year does to that probability. If you do the computation, you'll find that the gap between these two probabilities is very different compared to the gap between the 45 and 46 year old people. In other words, the effect of each predictor on the probability is different depending on what level of that predictor you're at. If you're talking about people who are 45 or 46 year olds, then the effect of age is different than it is if you're looking at older people. And that's why we cannot make general statements in terms of probability. We can only make them in terms of odds. So the bottom line is that the change in the probability of membership for unit increase in a particular X, while holding everything else constant, is not a constant amount. Now let's look at testing the significance of individual predictors, asking the question, is this predictor contributing any explanatory power given all the other predictors that are already in the model? So this is just like linear regression, and we're going to use the coefficients right here and the standard errors. And in fact, the p-values are already 
incorporating the coefficient and standard errors in order to give us statistical significance. Please just note that once we move into large samples, p-values become meaningless. And then what you really want to concentrate on to ask a question about whether I should keep gender or not is look at the coefficient itself. It might be very close to zero, which means meaningless, and yet you'll get a p-value that's very significant. So in this case, if I want to test the significance of, say, age, I can look at this p-value, this was not a large sample, and conclude that indeed age is a useful explanatory variables given the other information. So let's get back to the concept of profiling. This is the term that I used for explaining in the case of a categorical y. What does it mean to use logistic regression for profiling? For instance, go back to the beer preference example that we've been looking at. We might be interested in profiling the light beer drinkers, which means comparing them or contrasting them with the regular beer drinkers. What is different about these two groups? Are they different age groups? Are they different genders? And what we're doing with logistic regression, or another classifier, is asking what in this multivariate relationship between the different variables, age, gender, marital status, what in that combination separates the two classes of interest? So we're really trying to find out the x's that separate the two classes of interest. Let's look again at the advantages and weaknesses slide that we had in the previous session on using logistic regression for prediction. In fact, we can think of these advantages and disadvantages in the same way when we're considering profiling. The fact that logistic regression is model-based means that we can profile even with a small amount of data. But it also means that we have to specify the exact formula for the different x's that go into this relationship. The fact that logistic regression is interpretable means that we can actually use it for explanation, because if it's a black box, then it's not useful for explanation. Using variable selection is a little bit tricky. It depends on how you're going to use logistic regression for explanation or description. If you have a very firm theory or domain knowledge and you know exactly which variables need to be there, then you might not consider variable selection, where an algorithm picks which variables to put in or to take out. But if you're more in an exploratory mode, where you're open to many different variables that might be separating the classes of interest, then variable selection might be a good start for exploration. Finally, remember that when we fit a logistic regression, we're fitting one single formula for our entire data set. And if you think that one formula is not going to be sufficient, you can either break it down by introducing interaction terms, or you can break the data set down into subsets and then fit individual logistic regressions to different subsets. So logistic regression, think of it similar to its cousin, the linear regression, with all the good and bad in terms of explanation and in terms of prediction.